Hello, uh, and welcome to another video by the AIA Contract Documents. Today is April 13th, 2020. Um, just to put it in perspective as to uh, when we're doing this recording. Uh, today, uh, in this video, we're going to be talking a little bit about the architect standard of care, delayed services, and site visits, specifically as they relate to um, the COVID-19 pandemic, but also just kind of general issues surrounding those topics. My name is Jimmy Germano, uh, and I'm joined by my colleague, Mike Coger. As always, it's important to remember that we cannot give legal advice uh, on this video. Nothing you hear in this video should be considered a substitute for uh, consulting with an attorney who's licensed in your jurisdiction and who can talk to you about your specific contracts and the specifics of your situation. Uh, also, it's important to remember that the COVID-19 pandemic is causing all of these issues to constantly evolve a little bit more quickly than usual. So some of the material we discussed today might be a little out of date if you're watching this video in the future. So it's important to double check with applicable laws and contracts and orders, proclamations, et cetera, just to make sure that you're still on good footing with any of the information we're providing here today. Uh, so with that disclaimer and the one you saw on your screen, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Mike Coger, Mike Coger to talk a little bit about uh, the architect standard of care. Thanks, Jimmy. So as you just mentioned, I'm going to go ahead and start by more of a general conversation about uh, the architect standard of care, you know, let everyone know how it works, where you can find it in your contracts, and some of the big issues that pop up when we're discussing the architect standard of care. And then we'll, you know, kind of, you know, after that, we'll talk about some of the more specific issues that architects uh, will be running into or likely to run into uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So if you're looking at your contracts at home, uh, the architect standard of care can be found in section 2.2 uh, of B101-2017. Uh, and you're not going to actually find the phrase standard of care in that manner in the B101 agreement, but section 2.2 is the section that we refer to as the standard of care. And if you're looking at other owner architect agreements that are offered by the AIA, they're all going to have very similar language, or actually they'll have identical language. So for example, if you're looking at B105, uh, the same language is in Article 1. Uh, if you're looking at uh, B104, this same language is in Section 2.1. And similarly, it's found in, in all the other uh, owner-architect agreements that the uh, AIA produces. So the architect standard of care is the legal standard by which an architect will be held or judged uh, when evaluating the manner in which the architect is performing its services. And I'm just going to read the standard and then the, the language in Section 2.2, and then we'll kind of break it down a little bit piece by piece with some of the, the items I think that are more important to focus on. So uh, Section 2.2 says that the architect shall perform its services consistent with the professional skill and care ordinarily provided by architects practicing in the same or similar locality under the same or similar circumstances. The architect shall perform its services as expeditiously as is consistent with such professional skill and care and the orderly progress of the project. So the first uh, you know, phrase I have highlighted in there is ordinarily provided. So we're not talking about an architect being held to a standard of perfection. This is a standard that is flexible. And it means that, you know, an architect should be providing services that are, you know, in line with their peers who are acting in their same jurisdiction and under the same circumstances. So one thing to point out, and you'll, you'll find that flexibility throughout this entire recitation of the standard of care. The next phrase that comes up twice in the first sentence is, is same or similar locality and then same or similar circumstances. So the standard of care is location specific and circumstance specific. So we're talking about context. So anytime there's a question about an architect's services, what services they need to provide or um, what services they have provided, whether those services are adequate, you're going to be looking at, you know, what's the standard in that locality? Uh, what is the standard in given those same circumstances? The next phrase I think that, that is, you know, important particularly when we're talking about the kind of issues that architects are facing with COVID-19, um, is the last sentence. It says, the, it doesn't just say that the architect shall perform its services expeditiously. It says, as expeditiously as is consistent with such professional skill and care and the orderly progress of the project. So again, context matters. 
Uh, and right now, architects are impacted by you know, the COVID-19 pandemic in a number of ways that we'll get into in the next couple of slides, particularly when we talk about you know, potential delays that architects might be facing. So there's two ways you, that we typically think of standard of care issues, either forward-looking or backward-looking. Um, and by forward-looking, I mean you know, an architect is faced with a series of decisions, design decisions or decisions that they might need to make on a project. And they're asking themselves, well, what should I do? Well, from a legal perspective, they should be performing their services as consistent with the professional skill and care ordinarily provided by architects, practicing in the same or similar locality under the same or similar circumstances. So it is you, you need to be acting like your reasonably prudent peers uh, in whatever situation you find yourself in. And then backward looking, this is the legal, legal standard that your services that have already been performed will be judged by. So courts, uh, juries, arbitration panels will be looking at this standard and they'll be judging your services that you have performed by this standard. So one other kind of uh, practical note to pick up on here is, you know, whenever you get a negotiated contract that's given back to you that might have some edits, make sure you take care to look at this provision and make sure that there's not been any changes that might uh, impact you in a, in a significant way because it is very possible to just edit a few words in this two sentences that we've been reading and uh, and change the standard uh, pretty significantly and and it could even potentially with just a few minor phrase changes require you to provide you know a warranty or a guarantee that might not be covered by your professional liability insurance so this is one that you should definitely flag as as a provision you should be reviewing in any contract negotiation Mike if I could I'll kind of Pause right there. Would would it be possible for you maybe just to give an example of a you know a standard of care? A quick example, just to maybe put a little bit of meat on the bones of what you were just talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of the you know you know when you read the standard of care, it kind of begs for uh, an example to to understand it. So I'll give an example about specifying pain. So just imagine you're in. You know, I'm an attorney. I used to be an architect years ago. I so I'm probably going to say some some things that legally will be correct, but from a paint specification might not be um, uh, perfectly stated, so bear with me. But I'll, I'll give an example of an architect who is tasked with specifying you know, a paint restoration for an exterior surface of a building that's got paint that's existing and it's crumbling. And there's a number of decisions that an architect has to make when, when uh, thinking through a problem like that and putting together a specification on you know, replacement paint for, for an existing facade. You know, they have to think through things like, you know, what is the climate in that particular location? They have to think through things like what kind of a preparation are we going to be doing to the existing surface? I mean, are we going to, you know, just recommend or uh, or require you know wire brushing, or we're going to require something a little bit more to knock off all of the existing paint, something like you know uh, sandblasting or you know something along those lines. And beyond just the surface preparation, there's a number of decisions that an architect has to make with regard to coatings and you know underlying coatings, and then how many coatings and what type of a paint um, is is going to be you know applied to that surface. And it is all very circumstance and situation and location specific. You're not going to find uh, a rule book that an architect can, can, can go, go to to check off, all right, I've done all these things, I've met my obligation here. It really is up to the architect to, you know, to use the resources that they have available and use their professional judgment uh, in order to put together that paint specification. And so you know, if it's a backward looking situation where an architect has provided a specification for you know, for new paint on an exterior surface, this standard, section 2.2, is how the architect's services are going to be judged. It's, you know, the architect's not going to be guaranteeing that the paint specification they put together is going to 100% do the job no matter what. They're required to meet the standard of care uh, with regard to that paint specification, and that's it. So, Jimmy, now that you've mentioned an example, like, you know, I'm kind of curious as to, could you kind of give folks an idea of how, how does one prove uh, whether or not the standard of care has been met in, you know, like a, uh, a litigation scenario or in a dispute scenario? It's been a number of years since I've done litigation. I know you more recently have been involved in that world. Can you give folks an idea of how that works out? 
Sure, yeah. So I guess I'll use the example that you just described. An architect is hired to do you know, exterior paint um, renovation. Let's say they complete their project, they repaint the side of the building, and maybe a year later, the paint starts to fall off, right? Well, that owner is going to start to think, well, did that architect breach their standard of care? Did they not perform in accordance with the standard of care when they you know, described the methods that were going to be used to repaint the side of this building? Um, and, you know, an easy way to think of it would be, you know, let's say the owner thinks, well, you know, my paint shouldn't be falling off in a year. Uh, and the architect is going to go back and look then, okay, well, what did we recommend? And the owner is going to look, what did the architect recommend? Uh, was it reasonable for the architect to recommend those types of issues? Most of the time, uh, an owner is going to go out and find a third party, uh, an expert witness, so another architect in the community to come in and look at the project record and say either, yeah, what this architect did was reasonable and it just happened to fail, uh, or that, arch that third party architect is going to come in and say, no, what this architect did actually was, was below the standard of care. Um, they, they're, to use the language from 2.2, their services were not consistent with the professional skill and care that's ordinarily provided by architects in this locality. Um, and, you know, a, a, a simple example would be that third party architect comes in and says, you know, any architect in this locality under these circumstances is going to recommend sandblasting as a, you know, a pretreatment. And if the architect that the owner hired did not suggest or even think about or recommend or discuss sandblasting, then that might be a way to show, well, okay, this architect may have fallen below the standard of care because they didn't do this thing. They didn't take this approach, recommend this approach that most architects in that similar locality would have used that that approach, architects with that similar skill and care. And those the services that are provided by that third-party architect are usually referred to as expert witness services. So expert witnesses are usually brought in after the fact. Sometimes it can be during the project if the owner wants a second opinion, but usually it's because something failed, something didn't go well, the owner can bring in an expert witness, an architect, to say, hey, we want a second opinion. Can you take a look at this? And that expert witness can say, you know, either these prior services met the standard of care, i.e. that architect did a good job, or they did not meet the standard of care and that's why this issue failed, i.e. They, they, you know, they did not do a good job. There's still a bunch of other issues that come into play. That's sort of the basic framework. Another little subtle nuance of that, and this gets a little bit down far afield into the legalese, but in most situations, an expert witness is required. So if an owner wants to say that an architect breached the standard of care, they have to bring in an expert witness to testify that the architect breached the standard of care. So they need someone to come in and say, no, in this locality, under these circumstances or similar circumstances, sandblasting would have been and should have been required. And then obviously the architect can have an opportunity to defend themselves. However, it's not always required in every jurisdiction. There are some issues, if they're just so blatantly obvious, you know, an architect maybe just recommended like the wrong color paint, something that like anybody, you don't even need to be an architect to know that that's probably a breach of the standard of care. That fell below the professional skill and care that's ordinarily provided. In those situations, if it's just such a blatantly, patently obvious breach, then an expert witness might not be required. And that's something obviously that a, you know, a lawyer or a judge might need to determine. But that's just a little uh, nuance there that comes into play sometimes depending on how obvious uh, the issue was and the breach was. Excellent. Thank you for that. And to follow up on that, the, the term of art that I've heard, especially in California, is certificate of merit is the requirement that uh, an architect or somebody of a, of a similar professional background certify that there's a good basis for a claim. You'll use that term used in, in a number of jurisdictions, so be on the lookout for whether or not that's required. There's a whole lot of case law as to who can testify as to standard of care breaches, uh, you know, for an architect. I mean, in certain circumstances, structural engineers, engineers can, but it, it's a very fact-specific inquiry with regard to that. So thank you for that. I will just touch on one other issue before we move on and that is the building code. Uh, a lot of folks, architects will ask, well, why, does, why isn't the building code just the standard that the architect has to design to? And 
you know, and, and it's because architects do make decisions that are far beyond what the building code would require. The building code is typically just um, focused on health, safety, and welfare aspects, fire prevention, fire containment, you know, ingress, egress, ADA accessibility. It's not going to get to all of the things that an architect is going to be responsible for on a project. Things like paint and specifying paint and water intrusion, uh, waterproofing. So those kinds of things. But one issue that we actually, uh, at the AIA, we dealt with a lot recently, with the Risk Management Committee um, and some other committees uh, at the AIA with sustainability issues, when it comes to building codes and, and how that relates to the standard of care, one thing that comes up relatively regularly are floodplain maps um, and how and whether architects should design to those. And it's something that really is a good example of the standard of care when you're talking about like locality or circumstances because you know, an architect in Vail, Colorado is not going to need to worry about floodplain maps, but an architect in, you know, southern Louisiana, it, you know, is going to be well versed in how those floodplain maps work. And, you know, maybe it's understood in that locality that you can't design to the floodplain maps. You need to go that elevation plus two meters or whatever the case may be. Um, and an architect who's not in that locality, or maybe just, you know, a citizen who's not an architect who's not really going to understand that. So that's sort of an example that the um, the AIA has been discussing a lot lately and how to deal with that. But I, I thought about that as you were talking about it, so I wanted to bring it up. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, very, very good point. So I'm now going to turn to two issues that are more specific to the COVID-19 pandemic. The delays that architects might be experiencing in their services and how that's handled in our uh, B100 series documents, and then site visits and how, how they're handled. And, and just, but the way we wanted to give a very, you know, a relatively thorough explanation of the standard of care because underlying all of the issues that an architect is going to be dealing with in providing their services, particularly the COVID-19 issues that are coming up, is the architect's standard of care. And we wanted to point out that it is, you know, location-specific, circumstance-specific. You hear occasionally that our people will say that the standard of care has changed due to some event. Well, the you know, for example, COVID-19 has changed the architect's standard of care. It's not necessarily true. The standard of care is the same, but because uh, circumstances can yield a different result in the architect's services, th then it is that in cir change circumstances definitely do change what the architect is going to be uh, required to provide. So in COVID-19, you know, pandemic issues, you know, architects might be providing their services in an altered manner. And that might be okay because of the standard of care and, and how flexible it is. Let's get on to the next section that we're going to focus on, which is Section 3.13 of B101. Um, and this is a requirement that the architect uh, set forth, you know, their services and a schedule for their services at the outset of providing them. And I'm not going to read this whole section, but I will read one, one area that I think is important. Once it's the very... Let's see, second to last sentence says, once approved by the owner, time limits established by the schedule shall not, except for reasonable cause, be exceeded by the architect or owner. So, you know, you've got to be thinking in terms of, you know, given all of the issues that we've been facing with COVID-19, are there reasonable causes for architects to be delaying their services in some way? Certainly, if a project is completely shut down and you literally can't go onto a site to do a site visit, yeah, that's probably a reasonable cause. Similarly, you know, architects are going to be working from home. There might be complications with uh, with that and, and delays that are produced as a result of, of kind of working in a non-traditional manner. Also, you know, there are a number of things that an architect does that requires them to coordinate with other agencies or utilities, building departments, zoning agencies and zoning boards. You know, you might not be able to get approvals uh, or signatures or stamps from building departments like you as quickly as you would have two or three months ago. So all of these kinds of things uh, are, are potentially implicated when we, when we look at the schedule for the architect performing their services. And there might be reasonable cause, given your circumstances, to have delayed the provision of your services. And then lastly, you know, an issue that I know a lot of architects are facing is um, how do I do site visits in a COVID-19 scenario when I've got, you know, potential, potentially job sites are shut down or it's hazardous to my health to get out to a job site? Uh, and the, the section you want to look at in, in B101 for uh, the evaluations of the work or site visits is section 
0.6, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. I'll just read the standard there and we'll talk a little bit about how the COVID-19 pandemic might impact the, the site visits an architect would, could do. The architect shall visit the site at intervals appropriate to the stage of construction or as otherwise required in section uh, 4.2.3 to become generally familiar with the progress and quality of the portion of the work completed and, and so on. I won't re read the remainder of it, but again, this is a flexible standard. And the architect's standard of care is an underlying theme throughout all of the services an architect is going to provide. So if there is no construction work being done uh, on your site, you probably don't have to go visit the site in order to, you know, become familiar with the progress of the work. Or if the site has, you know, if there's significantly less trades that are performing work on your project, you might be able to go at, at less intervals instead of going every two weeks, maybe once a month is acceptable now. There's nothing in here that says if there's a global pandemic, you can stop going to the site for site visits. But given the language that we've already quoted with the standard of care and uh, with the schedule of delayed, potentially delayed schedule of the architect's services, there's probably some reasonable arguments for architects, depending on your jurisdiction uh, that you could and where you're at, that architects can make to asking for and, and getting accommodations from the owner and for the contractor uh, for, you know, site visits either to be done remotely possibly or to be done with some kind of protocols in place for safety of the architect who's doing those kind of uh, on-site uh, observations. So what can you do? We've put together a bit of a list for things that you can do if you find yourself in a situation where you're expected to go out to a job site and expected to do a site visit or a punch list. The first thing to do is to communicate with the owner and contractor about the situation and the problems that are presented. And I think we've given some, some good language in the B101 that, could, uh, that you can use to negotiate with with regard to the architect's standard of care. But the next thing to do is really to agree upon a solution that works for your project. You know, it could be limited site visits, less personnel on each site visit, you know, what kind of uh, personal protection, protective equipment, you know, would an architect be expected to, to get from the contractor when they're on the site in order to, to provide a, a safe way of conducting a site visit? And then maybe even conducting site visits at non-working hours when there's no other or, or limited contractors on site. And lastly, it's, you know, something that you might want to discuss is doing virtual site visits, you know, either by video camera or it's being, you know, shot at different locations throughout the site or pictures or photographs or something that are sent to the architect, whatever, particularly when it comes to doing, you know, virtual or digital site visits, um, I think we would highly recommend, you know, establishing protocols for what exactly the architect is going to see um, and, ma and make sure that whatever it is that you've agreed to for the accommodations for the architect, to make sure that they are in writing uh, via a contract amendment. Um, and be very specific about those um, protocols or the, the adjustments to the site visits that the architect is going to be uh, relying upon. Um, we do offer a couple of documents for amending owner-architect agreements. Um, for these types, we would recommend using G802. Um, and Jimmy, I know that you worked recently with the Risk Management Committee at the AIA to put together a white paper, uh, or excuse me, an article about, you know, that touched on site visits. Do you have anything to add to what I've already said here? Um, yeah, so that, that article that you're um, uh, referencing there is, you know, a pretty deep dive into how the standard of care relates specifically to site visits during COVID-19. And it's, uh, you know, of course, it can't say do X, Y, and Z, and an architect is going to meet the standard of care because really no one, no nothing, uh, no one can really comment on that right now. But it's more of a list of things to consider, uh, and it really focuses on the fact that the more architects understand right now about what's reasonable in their situation and what other architects in their community uh, and nationally might be doing uh, right now, the better. Um, equipped they are, they're going to be now and in the future to say that what they're doing is meeting the standard of care, that every architect in the country right now is doing X, Y, and Z when it comes to site visits. And I think an uh, you know, an owner or a contractor would be hard-pressed to say that an architect breached the standard of care when every single architect in the country might be doing the same exact thing. Um, you know, obviously, there, you know, there might be exceptions to that, uh, but uh, the more an architect understands about this issue, I think the better equipped they're going to be to, to deal with it later on if something happens to come up.
Excellent. So uh, if you have any, as always, if you have any other questions uh, about, you know, AIA contracts uh, in general, you can go to our website or you can contact us at the email address uh, for our doc info uh, email line and, and you can give us a phone call at, at our doc info telephone number as well. Thank you as always for joining us on this video.